Good evening, folks. I'm, my name is George Mangatis. I am the director for the Center for Experiential Learning and also a member of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. It is ple uh, to my pleasure to see so many people in the stands tonight, sitting, to listen to Carl. Um, what we're hoping this evening is to talk about a different aspect. Usually when we're talking to you, we're presenting, we're giving you history behind genocides, you know, people at their worst. Well, I think Carl's coming to us from a different perspective tonight. To try and how are we trying to fix a problem that may be inherently evident that's divided people in many, many ways? And he's going to talk about his experiences working in Rwanda, getting two tribes that have been historically at each other. And we know, if you lived through the, the 90s, you know the problem. Incredible numbers of people were slaughtered gratuitously because of ethnic tensions. And how do you put something together to make the country go forward. So this is Carl's third time with us. One time he was in person, once virtually, and the second time he is here again. I was worried this morning when we woke up that it might not be a reality. It was a little bit interesting. We, we, we're not used to this. We were in spring, now we went back to winter. But see, the sun does shine and things work out. Without further ado, Carl Williams. this thing banished from my throat. <clears throat> and, you know, this could be like a, just an introduction, this 40-minute piece, to the real um, authoritative one that's been used now for, for 20 years, uh, Frontline. Some of you, of course, are familiar with PBS and Frontline. They did the documentary. Well, they aired the documentary, Greg Barker is the filmmaker. He worked for five years on this documentary and it aired in 2004 at the 10 year anniversary of the genocide. And that's when a lot of people were learning more about Rwanda. And teachers, they already knew about it because of news, but they're like, how do we teach this? And so they saw that two hour documentary. And again, that one too is pretty easy to find um, if you go on to YouTube. You just search Ghost of Rwanda, Ghost Plural, G O. S of Rwanda. And you should come up with, of course I've been searching online so you would see it, but uh, more, more frequently. Um, this one right there, Ghost of Rwanda, oh, there we go. Okay, now it's trying to stream it so it's not gonna show it to you. I will take a screenshot and I'll, I'll beat this system. Um, <laughs> so we'll back here to our, to our folder full of pictures and I'll just load that little screenshot I grabbed. Um, it's called Ghost of Rwanda. And you'll see, typically it's not General Dallaire. I must have been playing part of it, his face is there. Typically you'll see um, the Prime Minister who was, who was killed at the beginning. You'll see her um, picture with her children 
That's who you'll see when you search Crystal Brook, typically on YouTube. That's a two hour film, really tough one to watch. Really, um, I always tell people, don't do it by yourself. I had a, a military guy write to me, I mean, a lot of people wrote to me after that. Since I was there, I was one of the people they interviewed, I should finish the first part, and teachers who are looking for a resource, they're like, okay, here's this, and oh wait, there's this American guy, who I wasn't, sometimes I'm, well, I thought for years I was the only American that stayed, and um, wrote a little book based on stories that I recorded for my wife and kids. I wish I had more, I only have like 10 of them here, but if somebody, some copies afterwards, we suggest like a $10 donation just to help them keep going. I need to print a new batch. We go 10,000 at a time. Um, but I, uh, so it's, it's not true. I'll tell you right at the beginning. Rwanda, through the eyes of the only American to remain in the country through the 1994 genocide. Hopefully we'll get the title cover changed because a little Catholic sister, well not, but yeah, she's not a little Catholic sister in Texas retired. Somebody came to her and she was there under the radar. Nobody knew about it. And it was so cute because she's like, I thought I was the only one. <laughs> well, I thought I was the only one. But um, so I was the only one in Kigali, but she's a uh, sweet, amazing lady. She would not abandon her Rwandan sisters. There was just no way she was gonna leave. Um, and so I, uh, if you want to get more, in, as I would say, more in depth into that story, those are two resources that you could use. And to finish, the Ghost of Rwanda, teachers in 2004 started asking, will you come talk to my kids? So two or three days a month, I would travel to schools. Did it for four years. The genocide was raging by that time in Sudan, the Darfur region, and I'm like, I was wondering during the, the 30, you know, the, the sorry, the, the three months, the 100 days of genocide in Rwanda, I'm sleeping in the hallway of my house wondering, does the rest of the world give a rip? And then here I am, years later, the rest of the world with all of you. And so I quit my job in 2008, and I started traveling to schools full time. So I've been doing that for 16 years now. I was 50 years old when I quit my, my regular job. Right? And, um, I take, in 2009, started taking teachers to Rwanda um, to just experience, for, especially teachers who teach about Holocaust and genocide, to experience it for themselves. And um, this really fun picture is in front of a new ministry building in Rwanda. You know, apartment system, so instead of Department of Ed, Department of Transportation, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Transportation. This is ministry, get this, Ministry of Unity and Civic Engagement. What's better formula could you have for unity than, than a ministry like that? I, I'm like, boy, I wish we had so much to learn. I mean, I'm not being facetious. We have so much to learn from Rwanda. So many times, you know, we've looked like we think we're the leaders of so many things, and we look at where we are today, and we're like, we got some stuff screwed up. And um, I think tonight we'll, we'll I hope you'll, you'll um, join in with me and just really a fierce sense of pride for what these people have done. I, I often tell people it would be much easier if the country had been, okay, something started playing. Okay, I know who that is. Or is that some green thing? Oh, that's so easy. I'll think about it as a meeting. All right, all right. That's we'll good. Like I'll, take the, I'll take the unicorn. I'll take the unicorn. Um, how, how do you begin to tell a story like this, huh? And as I was saying, it would be easier if those million people, I mean, I don't, yeah, it would have been easier. I hate to even put that word with a million people, but if it had been a, a natural, if it had been a volcano, or if it would have been an earthquake or something, you know, their landlock couldn't have been a, a tsunami, but that would be so much easier. I was just really struck yesterday as I was coming from the airport, listening to a podcast, a good friend who's a history teacher in Buffalo, New York, um, he, he actually wrote a book about America and tribalism politics. It's, I should put his title up here too. I'm super proud of this young man. He said, you know, one of the things that's worse than the enemy and the out group is the enemy within. And when your neighbor, when your pastor, your priest, your school teacher, your nurse is in the crowd, your uncle is in the crowd who kills members of your family, it really, like, to the core shakes you. Who can you ever trust? I mean, if there's any reason, anybody got reason to be cynical, it's the people of Rwanda for what they lost and how it happened. 
And so this isn't a country that's trying to rebuild from zero. This is a country from who knows, 50, 100 below zero to try to come and build a, a country. So that video like I just showed you, the three minutes, you know, the, the barista and the, uh, the ranger conservationist and the house designer, the art, I mean the clothes designer, the artist, all just wonderful snapshots of the new life that really is flourishing in Rwanda. I was um, a week on Long Island three weeks ago with schools, and the young lady in the front, one auditorium, she's like, I was just in Rwanda in October. I'm like, serious? Yeah, I'm from that area. And that's all my dad's a doctor, and they go on medical trips over there, and he took me, and I'm like, so, what surprised you about Rwanda? And I'm just like, I'm thinking, you know, like, it was so clean, it was so beautiful, you know? I heard that a third, no, no, it's in the Constitution that a third of every decision-making group, a third of the parliament, a third of the, minimum of a third has to be women. And I thought maybe she would talk about gender equality. The, the parliament, by the way, last I heard was 62%. I should go back to her room and Google that tonight. It's a long time since I looked, it might be higher. But, but anyway, you know what she said? How nice the people were. That's what surprised her about Rwanda. And I love that even more than its cleanliness and its forward thinking and technology and you know, Volkswagen is assembling, I think, six different units in Rwanda, an electric car being assembled there in Rwanda. Electric motorcycle is the first high-tech smartphone factory in Rwanda. It's got so many firsts. It's moving forward in so many different ways. I am, I should probably find some pictures from, uh, from the internet. But this is just from my front yard where we used to live, when we lived there, and this is last July. Okay, and that's the group of teachers. They're just headed down the driveway. Um, but check the city, the view of the city, huh? It's just gorgeous. And none of those buildings were there. The only one that was there is this off-colored white flat one right here, kind of lower one right there. That's the hotel that the movie Hotel Rwanda was based on. I not only saw that hotel from my house every day during the times, I was in there four or five times a week. I never did meet the star of Hotel Rwanda that it was built on. I mean, I'm sure he must. Have, I'm sure he was there, but the story of a one-man hero thing. It was, from my perspective, and of course the UN soldiers, small handful stayed, huh? There were 2,500 enough to stop the genocide, but um, you know we used our power on the Security Council, along with other nations, to vote to <coughs> remove these. 2,500 UN soldiers who were there at the end of a three-year war, hoping that communicate the world is with you. We stand with you. You know, we're going, you're you're going in the right direction, and the world is with you. But unfortunately, these men will be the death of thousands of Rwandans because they're really strong. Like all those armored personnel carriers, once the killing started, boy, like a turtle in a shell, disappeared. You cannot fire, and I mean, it's not like they're cowards. Those men were not cowards. Those men were, especially the 280, 76 that stayed behind, uh, that General Dallaire, the Canadian general in charge, charge of the UN mission, those men who stayed behind, man, amazing the number of lives they saved. But before that, let me give you one short snapshot. There's another documentary, some of you teachers want to dig in, you might have. Before Ghost of Rwanda, there was one, I want to say five or six years after, it's called The Triumph of Evil. And in The Triumph of Evil, you'll see the story of Don Bosco Technical School. It was one of the places in the city where UN soldiers were bivouacked, were camped around, around the capital city. And when the killing started, first priority is my kids. How can I get my kids? How can we get grandma to safety? How can we get our family? If we can get to Don Bosco Technical School, then we might have a chance of surviving. More than 3,000 people will congregate at that school. For several days, the militias will be circling the school compound in their pickup trucks and chanting and singing with their, with their I mean, man, there's, there's a festive, a really obscene, festive um, spirit in the killing. They're singing. I mean, we're getting people to do something that I believe we are not wired to do. We are wired to connect. We are not wired to destroy. But when our wiring to connect gets wounded and cross circuits that we, we can we can move in that destructive pattern. 
on the on the second uh, the plane shot down Thursday Wednesday night. On Thursday, these Belgian soldiers will be killed. Very strategic move. It's like these guys. They had studied in Europe. I mean, I met a Canadian teacher years ago in Rwanda who said, I've been trying to contact some of the professors in Montreal who had, who had some of the architects of the genocide in their class. I'm wondering, when they saw this unfolding on television, the bodies, did they get on the phone to call their former student and say, what the hell is going on over there, you know? I mean, I, I love this teacher's idea of you, nobody's helpless. You know, call your former student. Call, you know, a lot of times call our government people, but but no, these men and women, it's like it's like they also they saw Black Hawk down before it was a movie in real time. When in Somalia, those American Rangers, that, that mission that went there going after warlords and some of the Rangers, uh, US Rangers who were killed, their bodies drove behind Jeeps in the streets of Mogadishu, Somalia, and people were like, oh, that's all Africa? And and they're like, ow, ow, ow. And we pulled out of Somalia, you know. But Rwanda was so different. But the planners of the genocide, they, they capitalized on this Africa, you know, like it's a country and not a continent. And they killed these 10 Belgian UN soldiers who were supposed to be guarding the prime minister. And that's the signal to the UN, get out, you are not welcome. They didn't just kill them, they chopped them into pieces. It's so horrific. And it was so contrary to the culture of Rwanda, which is a welcoming culture, which like this high school kid saw, the beauty of the people there. How in the world can you have a country that is so generous and so hospitable? You go to their house and they say, would you like some banana juice that we've made? Or maybe a soda? Now the banana juice is reasonable, they made it. The soda would be the equivalent of like 25 bucks. I don't know what strangers, you know, you'd be inviting into your house and offering them a $25 soda. And I would usually take the banana juice. Now, I didn't want to, you know, that was so nice of them, but I don't want to take the $25 soda. And I know it might send me to the loo, but, you know, because they don't have a refrigeration, and there'd be little things in there that would be bubbling, and, and it, would be, it would be transited for me. And so I'm like, first time, I'm like, I know what to do. I'm going to just chuck it. Just go ahead, because it, it, to me it tasted rotten. I mean, it's an acquired taste, you could say, huh? But to me, and I just chugged it and put it back on the coffee table. They filled it right up again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a of pasta. So I learned afterwards, you say, that you make that glass last for however long. <laughs> but that hospitality, how do you get them to go from these generous, hospitable people to murderers? Because the genocide would not have happened at the speed and to the, to the extent if it hadn't been for the cooperation of ordinary people. And so, look at me, I'm already, I'll, I'll finish the UN story, and then I'm not gonna do a lot more about 94, I'll, I'll do a little more, but I wanna get to post-genocide. Um, so the, the technical school where 3,000 people have gathered for shelter. These UN soldiers are killed, New York makes the decision to leave. Interesting, our ambassador, to the UN, Madeleine Albright at that time. Born, I'm told, in a displacement camp in Europe. Her parents survived the Holocaust. So here's a lady born, and, and I was shocked years ago when I went to Poland, and you know, the, the, the extermination camps and stuff, whether it's Birkenau or, or you know, Majdanek, Treblinka, all these different ones, man, they're hard to visit. I mean, I was so blown away, and I had already for years been taking teachers to Rwanda, and I'm like, Ooh, Rwanda is in my home, and I'm so comfortable in that. Here, I am just so deaf. I'm just like, it's, it's, I feel so assaulted, and I'm like, is that what I'm doing to teachers that I'm taking? How much time does it, do we need to give to process all these horrors that are there? And then we're in the regular other parts of Poland, and I'm like, wow, well, you know, here I'm looking at the signs of, you know, the, the Russian uh, occupation over the years, and on one, one building, a brass plaque on one street corner of a building there, and it talks about, I think it was about 60 Jewish people who survived the extermination camps, the gas chambers, tried to come home and were killed at home after it was over because the anti-Semitism was not done. These pathways, this thing, and I'm like, whoa. So that's why so many people, they had these displacement camps in Europe because they weren't safe to go home. And they're trying to go other places around the world. Here's, and, and you know what they said was, as soon as they got some security and some food nourishment, 
babies start coming. And one of those babies coming in this internment camp is Madeline Aubrey. Years later, she's on the Security Council. And an ambassador from Nigeria is saying, don't withdraw the, the this is according to Ghost of Rwanda, don't withdraw the UN soldiers. It'll be, it'll be unimaginable slaughter and killing. And he makes such a passion plea on the Security Council that Madeleine Albright, no pushover, she says to her assistant, hold on, I gotta talk to Marcia. We cannot vote to withdraw. Man, look how close. So many times, and it's really fascinating, whether it's history or in our own lives, we're so close to make one decision or another. And she goes out and she calls DC and DC says, you get back in there and you vote like we told you to vote. You know? and, and she does. And she says on the film, um, I probably should have resigned. I mean, I probably wouldn't have made any difference. And I'm like, holy cow, you bet it would have made a difference. You know, I've heard, I've had political analysts tell me, oh, she would have, big, big waves she would have caused if she would have resigned. But to every, the thousands and, and hundreds, literally hundreds of thousands of students now who have studied the Rwandan genocide, there would be that story of Madeleine Albright, who instead of voting to abandon the people of Rwanda, she resigned her position, she quit her job. And anyway, more than 3,000 people will be killed at that school when the UN leaves. I listened to one of the survivors of that massacre tell the story one day. Um, and he said, we ordered our, we didn't order, we told our young men, when they said the soldiers were leaving, no, they won't leave us, they won't abandon us. And we saw them with their packs and their guns going to their parking lot and the trucks. We said to the young men, go out there, lay in front of the trucks, they won't drive over you. And these young men courageously did that, stretched out in front of the trucks. The, the soldiers are really, I don't know their state of mind at this time. Some of their, you know, the 10 Belgians have been killed and chopped up. I mean, we're here, to, we're trained to protect. And now we're ordered not to. We're supposed to stand by and watch people get killed unless they fire on us. We can't fire back. And so it was most unimaginable. In fact, one Canadian peacekeeper, years later, he, he was on another mission, I think in West Africa, when he took his life. The Rwandan genocide had so many more casualties than, than the people of Rwanda. The soldiers will start the truck, rev the engine, the boys will hold strong, the young men. They'll lay on their horn. The young men don't look like an imaginable looking at each other. Hang in there, guys. Hang on. One soldier will testify. The first time I fired my weapon in Rwanda was to clear the parking lot of that school. And my best guess is those boys, when they heard the firing of that UN soldier, they thought those militia had been attacking, I mean, surrounding and threatening, that they were attacking. I got to get to my family. That's the natural response of a young man. Get to my family. They moved from the truck. The trucks left. More than 3,000 people. What really shocked me, again, I mean, there's so many shocks, I one after another, but years later, I found out that, and if some of you do um, watch this film, I'm Not Leaving, that I showed you on YouTube, you'll, you'll meet a guy in the film, well, we'll talk about it. These are all just sketches that were used in the telling of the story. We didn't just want talking heads. There's five people that are, me and my wife, UN soldier, uh, uh, a Rwandan gentleman who you'll hear more about, my hero, Gasigwa and then um, uh, uh, an American um, consulate, the consulate officer of the American Embassy, Laura Lane. In fact, some of you who know the story well, you, you probably know Laura's character, because she wanted to keep the embassy open. She's like, we cannot let this go unaddressed. And so we can't all leave, we can't abandon. She's like 26 years old, it's her second mission. I mean, it's competitive, how to get into foreign service and stuff like that. And, and um, Laura gives a TED talk years later, she's one of the vice presidents of UPS, all the government liaisons in all the countries around the world between UPS and the host country report to her. And she gives a TED talk, Laura Lane, when to disobey orders. That's not sounding exactly right. But you look up Laura Lane TED talk and you'll find her story. But in this film, we had an artist help us tell the stories as where the five of us are telling the story. And this is the man who I will build a relationship with, um, and he'll give me a travel permit to get through the city. The genocide is so structured, it's so built on obedience to authority. And these papers with the signature and the stamp of the colonel in charge of the city will get me through roadblock after roadblock. They'll, they'll open many doors for me. He, in fact, will be the one to tell me, you can work at this orphanage. He'll basically give me my marching orders, okay? Um, 
But I find out years later, he was also the one in charge of that massacre at that school of the 3,000 people. My friend Emmanuel, his older sister, older brother, mother, and baby sister made it to the school. Thought they would be safe. Soldiers left. Unbelievable odds that two out of four actually survived. Sorry, I thought I had all my alarms on. Two out of four of his family. His mom will die, and the little baby in the arms of his older sister will pull it through the jaw. I guess mercifully quick will take the life of that little. She'll be hit in her in her breast and her arm, and she'll go down in faith like she's dead, and she'll survive like that. Um, and she'll occasionally peek and look in, at the killing of one slaughter, and she'll identify that man as the one in charge of this execution. This idea that there's good guys, bad guys, is what we're constantly, I'm trying to figure out. I come in late to a movie with my kids, you know, watching, I'm like, wait, is this a good guy, bad guy? We, we have that myth that we still try to frame the world in, and it's that, it's a myth. It doesn't help us understand more. There's people who do, and that's one of the keys, huh, to a good movie and a good story, is when they reinvent the character, huh? You know, that guy's such a jerk, and by the end, oh, I hope they get together, you know? We, we, we are all capable of such horrible and such incredible forgiveness and love and uncon... So we'll get into those stories. I just, you know, they said tonight's not a structure, and I'm like, I should never hear that because <laughs> I'm gonna, it's seven o'clock already. So, so let me just kind of buzz through a little bit. How we went there in 1990, we were with the humanitarian arm of the Adventist Church, huh? the, the um, Adventist Development Relief Agency. We happened to be partnering with the people to build schools, to operate clinics, a great place um, for our kids to grow up. You know, there was no internet, so we went to the library. We lived in Maryland at the time and, and to look up Rwanda in the library. And all we could pretty much find was Diane Fossey and the gorillas, you know, gorillas in the mist. And, and so we're there for four years before this horrible event will begin to unfold. As I said, plane shot down Wednesday night. Thursday, the prime minister is killed, not because she's a Tutsi, the minority, but because she's not with the extremists. These soldiers are killed. It'll effectively, it'll work just like they planned. The UN will leave. All of the um, foreign embassies will tell their nationals, you've got to get out. The African embassies, Tanzanian embassy will tell us nationals, you have every embassy is saying, get out of, get out of Rwanda. The Chinese embassy, everybody is doing and it's, the genocide doesn't start with the shooting down of the plane. The coup starts with the shooting down of the plane. And then the first genocide, and I make it, it may be only a short amount of time, but I think it's a really important differentiation because so many people, when they hear this story, we're trying to figure out, they're like, oh, so Hutus were killing Tutsis? The young lady who survived in our house will marry a man who had a Hutu ID card after the genocide, she'll marry him. Almost all of her family was killed. And she says, no, not by Hutus, by extremists. So this really trying to go a little below the top level that says Hutus are killing Tutsis and, and understand more dynamic. It's like, I compare it, and I hope it makes sense to you, it's like Republicans and Democrats. Do we really know a lot about the person's beliefs when we just say that? We assume a lot, and our assumptions are usually on the far edges of things. So we assume because that's what gets reported the most, and that's what we hear about the most, and that's what bothers us the most. And so what bothers us the most is what we tend to hang on to, to define the other group by. But you find in the center people who really do share so much more in common than this idea. I think the, re the, the recent test um, um, research that I was reading and stuff about this um, was that it's like, ah, shoot, man, my numbers are gonna be rough here, but you'll get the, you'll get the idea, it's like, you know, 64% of the Republicans thought that all of the Democrats, uh, I'm just messing this up, I probably shouldn't even go there. But, but the point is that they believed many more of the other side thought they were terrible than when they actually asked the other side. And the other side actually started saying, no, I don't believe that about them. Yes, there are some way over there or way over there, but we tend to define the other by the extremes. Now, what got me started on that was yes, that we're not defining this as a Hutu Tutsi. I would say it doesn't, it doesn't begin with that. 
the, the, the Rwandan genocide against the Tutsi was not rooted in hatred among the majority Hutu or Tutsi. Between, I should have said, huh? I just wrote that last night. It was a little late, and I was trying to, because I would say these things, but I'm a visual learner, and last night I'm like, I gotta put this in writing, you know, so people can actually have a chance to look at this and absorb this idea. If you heard that it was Hutu Tutsi, well, that's the first glance, and I understand. But the next glance is like, no, no, this is not from them. They married, they, they drank beer together, they played soccer together. The planners are going to have to work hard to break the bonds between, between the Hutu and Tutsi. You'll find this origin in the minds of men and women, greedy for power, masters at manipulating. And, and last night I'm like, what should I make bold? What should I underline here? You know, what really do we want to understand here? how this greed for power and, and the ability to manipulate ordinary men and women to see the enemy in their neighbors. This is a sentence I came up with 20 years ago when I first started being invited to schools. I'm like, how do I start talking about genocide with kids? And I haven't found a more effective conversation starter on genocide than this one over all these years. And it's not just that this is super effective is that this still has a certain resonance in my own brain, which I hate. I don't want to kill anybody. But when somebody cuts me off on the highway, my first thought is not, oh, are they on their way to the emergency room? Oh, is that a neurosurgeon who's trying to, you know. <clears throat> my first thought is, what a jerk. He's going to get us killed, get him off the highway. Or, or you know the long line. You're driving in the left-hand lane on a four-lane four highway. and the right-hand lane, there's a semi in a long, empty space. You, and this guy comes ripping up past everybody. Do you step back? I don't. I'm starting to. Because I really want to rewire my brain. But I was more likely to make the distance between me and the vehicle shorter, so you better not try to get in there. My first response is not empathy, says the guy who stayed in Rwanda during the genocide. So many people think that, you know, you must be so different than me, or I could never do that. And I'm like, you could. You could. If you, if you lived with this young lady loving on your kids for years, anybody who loves you, she becomes like family. And when the American Embassy says, we're all leaving, you all, we have to leave, take your families, and, and get out of there. My mom and dad were visiting at the time, so that's another dynamic in this story. But, but um, I, I'm like, wait a minute. What do you mean we can't bring her along? Are we supposed to leave her there to be killed? When you have received generosity and, and, and privilege for years as a college kid, I went to South Africa, and that's a whole complex story there, but I was in one of the homelands they created, like we did reservations, they tried to preserve apartheid with these homelands that they called countries. Trans Sky was where I was for a year. Kind, generous, wonderful experience with the people. Zimbabwe again, four years. Zambia, two more years. Rwanda, we had, I had 11 years of African hospitality in many different countries and privilege that often made me uncomfortable. But here was a chance to use that privilege, maybe, to keep this young lady alive. If, if I was telling the Rotary Group, if, if she had been my blood sister and for some strange reason she was not allowed out of the country, I don't think people would have questioned why I stayed. Now I also understand, it's not just you, it's your family. And that was, is my first responsibility. And the 66-year-old Carl Ken say to the, to the 30, this picture was probably a week before the, the, the plane was shot down, before the genocide began. And I can say to the 36-year-old, 30, yeah, 36-year-old Carl, you know, what were you thinking? Because now I'm a grandpa like my dad, you know? But because my dad was there, I could trust my family to be safe. And I'd love you to meet my wife. That's why if you do watch the 40-minute film, I tried to get her to write a chapter in the book, and she was like, nope. And so, so I've written a bit about her in the book there, but you'll, you'll hear her voice in the film. Um, she never said, what about me and the kids, Carl? She never made it like a choice between this decision to help the people in our house or our family. She could have taken the kids out by herself. I found out she's so much stronger than I always than I had understood. I always say it's so easy to underestimate. Um, quiet people. <laughs> but but um, we will make the decision 
to, to stay. That privilege that they gave us for so long. I mean, you get to a church a little late or something, and your foreigners are like, they'll empty the front row. I'm like, no, 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 we can't sit in the back. They're like, what, you don't want our hospitality? No, oh, well, you know, okay, thank you. Well, now, that presence, that privilege that they offer to foreigners will have a, it won't be 100%, but it'll, it'll have, okay, I got it. God, I'm looking forward to go over here. Um, so that same night, Thursday night, after killing the Belgian soldiers, a gang will arrive at our house with an intent, an intent to the neighbor lady. We don't know it until the next morning because the neighbor ladies will turn them away, but with the intent to kill us. It was being broadcast on the radio. The Belgian soldiers were killed. Maybe this was an overzealous killing squad that said, hey, there's some white people there. Maybe they're Belgians. We'll kill them, too, to get rid of the foreigners. I don't know their motive. But the neighbor ladies were very clear. They were there to kill our family. And these neighbor ladies, out of their simple adobe brick tin roof homes, came out and courageously stood in front of these guys and started telling them stories about us. And I've wondered, how in the world did they do it? What, what's their secret? You know, I mean, their courage. Well, man, they, when they said our kids played with their kids, I'm like, well, that's their stuff. That sound like family too, huh? When somebody loves and plays with your kids, the bonds that can grow there. The other thing that I've looked at is as I've looked at the brain, and you know the amygdala, I love Dan Siegel. If any of you have heard Dan Siegel, he specializes especially in teen brains teenage brains, but Dan Siegel's the one that coined this phrase, upstairs brain, downstairs brain. And this has just helped me so much in understanding some of what was going on there. My, my best explanation, because I'm an I'm a old shop teacher, so I was really intrigued as I was looking through the windows in there and stuff. But, um, but I want to know, how's it work? You know, what, don't just tell me, you know, I think they kind of, I want to know, what are the mechanics, what's going on? And when I started learning about the brain and this idea of even something they call hot amygdala hijack, we're all familiar with the fight, flight part of things. And we go there in an instant, because you've got to, to survive. And to get back upstairs, to, the free, to get access to creative, logical, empathetic thinking, it's not easy when you're in your downstairs brain. I mean, you might be, man, it might be your anniversary, your birthday, or whatever else, and, and you're having an argument with somebody that seems to happen sometimes on those occasions, and you're like, can't we just forget it for today? Nope. Because my downstairs brain has got a hold of me. And until we get this thing sorted, don't you love me? This is not a love issue. Hello? This is a brain science issue. So it's not that I don't love you. It's just that my brain prioritizes survival. And survival is about my identity or my community. And when you attack my identity or my community or my sense of self-worth, my brain goes downstairs to fight or, you know, it's usually fight when it's when it's a friend because you don't usually run away from it. Oh no, you do denial. Anyway. <laughs> These neighbor ladies will tell stories and they'll get they'll get at least the leader out of his downstairs brain to his upstairs brain. We've got a country of of a nation of seven million people who have been at war for three years and they've been listening to the constant message on their radio about we're under attack. And it's those Tootsies, those Tootsies who killed our president. Those Tootsies who should have killed at independence. The Belgians gave them privilege, the colonizers. It backlashed and burned back. It, it worked to their disadvantage at independence. People tried to, you know, like they're sick of the Tootsies. They've been privileged. Discrimination always breeds hate. And it exploded at the time of independence. And many were killed. Others fled to the neighboring countries to, uh, thinking they could come back, I'm sure, in a week or a month. A year, 20 years, no, 30. They finally got military training and they came back 30 years later. So when the plane is shot down, it wasn't a hard sell to, to, to let them know that the, um, these uh, refugees had gone off at the time of independence before 1962. RPF stands for Rwandan Patriotic Front, that three year war that had been going on. Then we had peace where we thought, ah, we're all going to be safe. Um, but that's when the genocide will, will be the next event in the country. But this whole construct of the Belgians and a Tutsi king and the ID cards and, and saying, who are you, who are you, are Tutsi? And people married all the time, huh? like I said. If you look at, and this isn't really a fair demographic, but still, it, 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 it helps begin to get the point across. These, the top left hand, Dawson, Casica down below, these were men that we were working together building schools. 
Both those men had blue dragon cards, their wife had Tootsie Annie card. Damas in charge of the orphanage, the largest orphanage we were trying to help during the genocide, blue dragon card, his wife had Tootsie Annie card. The pastor and his wife who were in my house up there, they both had blue Tootsie Annie card. But they had other extended family who had Tootsie Annie card. So, so I really, um, I think it's so important for us to understand. When something horrible like a genocide happens, we want to distance. We would never do that. We want to distance ourselves as much as possible. Oh, they're tribes. Okay, that's why they did it. We're not tribes. We wouldn't do that. You know, we try to distance ourselves, and I'm trying to say, no, we are not so different. These, these kind of things that are happening there, this idea of, um, of being manipulated to see enemies in your, in your neighbors. Welcome to America. Last 10, 20, I mean, it's gone on, I'm sure, for much longer, but, but um, it, it, it's just, <sighs> and this idea of the people being in their downstairs brain now for three years, I'm not totally for three years, but, but going there, the more we go, the brain works on this path system. The more you fire certain ones, the more influential, I like to say. They'll talk about myelon sheath and, and the development of the neural pathways, which is really great science and stuff. But I think the easier thing for me to understand is simply the more you fire it, the more influential it is to other pathways in your brain, to other thought processes or strategies in your brain. And so, um, so this does not by any means fully explain how somebody goes from a pillar, uh, from a good neighbor to a pillar, but it's part of the story, this idea of how the brain works. And it's really useful for me in relationship with my wife, or I typically give the example at an at a airport, your flight gets canceled, if you blow up at the ticket agent, you think they're gonna, they're gonna find a, a creative, empathetic, critical solution for you? <laughs> Deeper in their downstairs brain. But you say, hey, whatever you can do for me, I'm, I'm grateful, I just, I'm glad I'm not in your position right now. I model that empathy, and that empathy comes back, and we could explore mirror neurons, all kinds of cool brain stuff with that. Um, so my wife and I will make the decision that I'll stay. We don't know, like you, that more than a million people are about to be killed. We don't know it'll last for three months. We think two weeks at the most. We can do this for two weeks. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it there for this, this part, 1996, except to say that these soldiers, refugee kids, got military training, fought for three years to come home, bring their families back to Rwanda, be reunited with grandma. Grandma's been in Rwanda all my life. But I've never met her because I'm not allowed back in the country. And Grandma stayed and was hidden by neighbors. And, and so to reunite families, to bring your family home, there's nothing. We have a hard time, I think, in our mobile culture here, moving here and there, and just to understand and appreciate the connection to the earth that people who live for generation after generation. So, you know, well, I guess you got some of that in Michigan, I guess, huh? Generation after generation. So these men and women will end the genocide. Now before I go to the post part here, anybody, a, kind of a question or two that's kind of been really, will get in your way from beginning to the next part you'd like to just kind of explore? You're pointing at him? He's okay, he's okay. He's always questions. He's always got questions. Well, we'll probably come out later, all right? Yes, please. Uh, I have a question, do you compare and contrast That is, that's a great, that's a great, great question. So I'm trying to think of just anecdotes that would help me um, respond to that. So I'll take a drink while I'm thinking. <laughs> I mean, those neighbor ladies standing in front of our gate was so Rwanda. My friend, um, my friend Gasikwa, who neighbors started coming to him saying, he had a Hutuiti card, his wife had a Tutsi. The local government guy had a Hutu. Each neighborhood, we want a super organized structure, break down to 10 family units. And, and each neighborhood had a, like I call them a mini mayor. The, the French call him a counselor. The counselor was Hutu, his wife was Tutsi. He comes to the and says, I don't think I can protect. The government guy, I don't think I can protect my wife and kids. Can they stay at your house? So he's got more than 40 people in a house that could fit in the front corner of this room right here. And when they come to kill, 
Instead of saying, what's wrong with you guys? These kids are our neighbors. You know them. They're not an enemy. You guys, you know, you should be ashamed. Driving them deeper in their downstairs brain. He's like, guys, this is really hard, huh? I, I, you want some chickens? Hard to feed your kids during this time. He'll use kindness to get them out of their downstairs to their upstairs brain. That's so rewarding. Um, my friend Damas, who's uh, got this orphanage with, this is kind of interesting to do. Um, <coughs> if I type in Kigali, Rwanda, and this will give us a bit of geography placement if you didn't quite have this clear in your mind. It's like right below the equator, right in the center of Africa, okay? Right next to the DRC. Burundi and Rwanda used to be one kingdom way back in history. They speak a language very similar to each other. And I go over to um, satellite view, and we'll zoom on, we'll zoom on down, and let me um, actually turn it sideways. That should be better here to to see. Okay, wait, I zoomed too far. I don't know where I am. All right, here we go. Here we go. So our house. Look at the airport over here. I always orient myself with the airport over here. This whole half of the city was controlled by the RPF quite quick in the first week or so. The one in each other front. Those rebel refugee soldiers who laid down their guns for the peace agreement. When the killing started, they picked up their guns again. And they're going to start working against the extremists, the coup government, which will control most everything. This, this uh, Kigali Convention Center right there and that yellow line squiggling left and right, that's kind of like a ridge and a dividing line. And the, and the extremists will have this side of the city. And our house will be right in, now the, the American embassy today is, um, I go up this. I do a lot better when I'm not looking at the big screen and I'm trying, the American embassy is right there at that round point. It wasn't there at the time of the genocide, but if you come down that road and you zoom in to this neighborhood and stuff, our house is partners in health and then just to the a little bit to the left there, a little road going up, and then the next house over, I think, they totally remodeled the roof and everything. In fact, it, it looks so fancy, I'm a little embarrassed to show people. But, but that was what was rented for us at the time. Um, that's where our house was. So if you do end up like watching that 40 minute film, this road, Kigali 3 Avenue that comes down, snipers would shoot at me when I drive through the valley on that road. I'd be heading away from the the dividing road, you know, if our house would have been on the other side of that road, I may not have stayed. Because our, our people in our house would not have been through, the RPF would have evacuated them to a safe part of the country. And they would have evacuated, forcefully moved, they forcefully moved everybody out. This is a battle zone. You cannot stay here. They're not using people as shields. But the extremists were using people as shields. And so where I was just going with this is over in this most densely populated part of the city, um, to the stadium, there's the stadium, and the road comes down right here, yeah. And this is the, um, there we go, Gesimba Memorial Center. Over here, let's get it in the middle, there we go. Gesimba Memorial Center. And, okay, you see the contribute little arrow ridge on the bottom? So there's that spot for Gesimba Memorial Center, okay, right there. That's the main building of the biggest orphanage we were working with. Actually, the first building wasn't in existence. It's the darker roof it was the dormitory and the main cafeteria and everything for the for the orphanage. Where you see the cars in the parking lot are with graves for little kids. First time I pulled in that parking lot, I saw these graves. And I thought these are kids slaughtered by the no, they're not slaughtered. They were dying from diarrhea. They just needed water. I have to pause for a second too. The first time I used Google Earth like this, I started crying. <laughs> All the trauma, and I don't even know if I'd started, yeah, but then I had started seeing a counselor, but you know, deal with PTSD and stuff like that. Um, if you want to get into this afterwards, because I am I'm having a hard time getting past the genocide with you, um, I'd love to talk with you about the difference between reliving and remembering, and how we can access traumatic memories without re-traumatizing ourselves. And this evening, as I look there, I do feel a sense of emotion in my heart, but no, not in my stomach. My body is not releasing adrenaline, cortisol, from my, all the different things that it does as you relive traumatic events. And so I, I, there's so much we could get into, but what was I telling you about? 
Gasiqua, um, taking water to the orphanage. Huh? Yeah, when we drive through the valley. <laughs> Gesequa, he had people at his house. Let me get back to the picture here. That, that'll maybe, oh, there are all the pictures there. We were going to talk about this and, oh, the Rwanda picture in front? Look, I lost myself. If we get back, if it, I always say if it's important, it'll come back. Um, that orphanage part, though, will come back. That was not a waste of our time. I want you to see that building for where we're one, one story in the post genocide portion. So the Gen Walter Yeah, this is so the leader of the Rwanda Patriotic Front, four years old when his family fled Rwanda as a refugee kid, grew up in a refugee camp, and, and after they end the genocide, he in his wisdom he says, We need a Hutu president here. The majority of the country is still Hutu, and the majority of the Hutus did not kill. Okay? It was the extremists, and vast numbers of them did. Some say three, four hundred thousand people were accused of genocide, but that's not a million, two million, four million, five million, you know? And so they will try to have a Hutu president afterwards. And if you really want to dig deeper, Stephen Kinzer's book, The Rebirth of a Nation, no, The Building, The Rebirth, A Land of a Thousand Hills, The Rebirth of a Nation and the Man Who Dreamed It, Stephen Kinzer. First third pre genocide, middle third genocide, last third post genocide. It's a great piece of work. He's both a journalist and a historian. Anyway, Stephen Kinzer um, will write a lot, and he'll write about President Kagame too. But the job will be now to rebuild trust. How can we rebuild trust in this country? Because peace is only going to happen with trust, which is a great question in America. How can we rebuild trust in our country? And we haven't gone through a recent genocide. We've gone through genocide in the past. I always make the point that some people do genocide and they stay in power. So driving them out, the extremists, out of power and out of the country and setting up a new government is, is an enormous task. But um, uh, when we committed genocide with Native Americans, we stayed in power, which, um, anyway, yeah, it's a whole other, whole other story. So. So look at this, huh? I just made a slight change. Genocide stems from thinking, says my world would be better without you in it. Does this make sense? Yeah. Trust stems from thinking, it says my world would be better with you. That's how we're gonna build trust. The real kicker here though is what if you committed genocide? These three, 400,000 who are accused of committing genocide. And so this is just one of the prisons I visited. It's 6,000 prisoners at this time, and this is years later when it's not overcrowded like it was before, at the, right after the genocide. Um, it'll take them more than 100 years to try all of these people with the, with the modern, normal justice system. I wrestle, I, part of me really wants to put retributive justice, retribution, because I think that's a more accurate description of our justice system. But I'm working often a lot with students, and most of us, even myself, before I started digging into this, I'd be like, retributive, you know. So I think punitive is where I'm sticking right now. But basically, you want to know who's to blame, punish them, have justice. If they don't have enough lawyers, they don't have enough time. They'll dig back in their history. I mean, they'll, dig, they'll, they'll not dig back. This has been going on for 400 years, problem solving. Um, a friend of mine who teaches at Buffalo State College, Rwandan gentleman, got a Fulbright scholarship just before the genocide. He got out of the country, lost so much of his family during that time. I'm having lunch with him just a year or two ago, and I'm still talking to him, asking, what are your thoughts about Kachacha? They set up these community courts based on this old tradition of the male elders of the community come together to solve your problem. And he says, I was got, I mean, this is a smart guy, huh? Fulbright scholarship and everything, he's still working here in the States. He's like, when I heard they were gonna use kachacha in my, in my country for people who did genocide, I'm like, what? We use kachacha when my aunt and uncle were having marriage problems. But you're gonna use it to address genocide? Well, not exactly the way it is. We're going to adapt it, but that will be at the foundation of our restorative model. They will spend the first six years after the genocide making the community, the country safe, working on the healing of things, because you don't want to unpack the harm. In this case, is mass murder and, and rape by your neighbors, by your pastor or your priest who's overseeing it, 
Or no organized church came out of the genocide with a reputation of standing up against genocide. No organized group came out with a reputation of love your enemy. It was a massive failure of organized religion. Another conversation there, too. I'm not throwing organized religion under the bus. I'm just like, man, if we can just focus. And, and this is my Christian bias. But if we can focus on the source of love and love in our neighbor, you know, and, and the rest of this stuff. Anyway. So Rwanda, Rwanda is also saying, and I, I try not to put too many words here, huh? but I had to put adversarial. We think we're going to fix an adversarial problem, an illegal adversarial problem, with a legal adversarial response. To me, is like, Mm, that seems like we need some discussion there. But this collaborative model, and usually it's just the lawyers and the judges' voices. Over here, we need all the voices. Not that long ago I added it, because I'm always trying to change and make this a little more clear. And even myself, I have such a long, uh, such a learning journey for me. But justice is not thrown out. It's part of the repair, but our top priority is healing. Because that's our best hope of breaking the cycle. So Rwanda will set up these communities. Okay, I skipped over this with Rotary, but let's take a, let's take a minute. You guys, are you thinking maybe an hour? We're in an hour. I'll, I will do my best to wrap in 15 minutes, and then we'll stay with your questions so long you want to, okay? Um, General Kanani, and I had to put him in his military uniform and then civilian. He's going to try to lead the country in a radical change from a punitive blame. Man, when would the feelings be stronger for Punishing, who's to blame and punish the people who did this to my family? To switch that thinking to the even idea of restorative and healing, why would we waste our time? I would think if it was my family that, had, that and I didn't lose my, my blood family. Uh, I just picked three quotes from him. Um, there's a lot we could do. Let's, I'll focus on the one. Africa's story has been written by others. We need to own our problems and solutions and write our story. And so the way that Rwanda is going to write the story, you can't just drop, I mean, I know they had gachacha, but this is a new kind of gachacha. You can't just drop it on people and expect it to work. They said, we got to prepare like you prepare the soil. You know, I'm going to put my garden where it gets sunshine. I'm going to figure out how I'm going to get water to my garden. This is, this is not an easy thing to launch an initiative to put in there. They're like, we've got to do away with the death penalty. And this gender equality, we need women, their, their wisdom, their, their tenacity, their compassion. We need women to rebuild trust, to heal. We need, so they wrote it into the Constitution. It's, it's written in their Constitution. And there's more, but I just picked those two. Um, and then they, they set up these courts. You, you would pick the judges. Nine men and women. They started out with 15, like, oh, that, that's way too many. Rwanda seems to be really good at checking it out, reevaluating, do it again. They wrote some laws about genocide after the genocide, and they and they thought, oh, that was we probably should have thought a little more about this and that. Let's rewrite them. They, they're not too proud. They're, it's very practical. Let's see what works. And so these would happen usually on the soccer field, usually Thursday afternoon. Shut down schools, shut down business. You are encouraged or ordered. You better have a good reason if you're not a kachacha. And and the guy in pink is a prisoner choosing to confess. And the community, he's the one, it's an opportunity to take, take responsibility. This whole idea of understand the harm is a long conversation, huh? Because we're not just talking about the victims. We're also talking about the perpetrators. We're talking about generations before. We're talking about colonialism. We're talking about so much generations to come. Understanding the harm is, is no small task. But the beginning is happening here. And I love the concept that when they started this idea, the experts said, you're crazy. You have blood all over the place. You will have another multiple genocides. They said, no, no, no. Ordinary people who are empowered to kill their neighbor. We believe ordinary people can, can lead out from this feeling of helplessness. The government is going to fix our problems. No, we have the power. Kachacha will give agency. It will give hope. It will give confidence to local people that we can solve our problem. We can write our own our problems write our solutions. And so these will happen all over the country. There'll be more than um, 12,000 of these courts. They'll have 1.9, because each person will have more than one case. They killed maybe more people, or they stole, or things like that. And, and the, the community courts would be great to unpack even further. A guy, sorry, I don't have a slide, but if you want to understand the community courts a little deeper, 
Phil Clark and Gachacha. You just search Phil Clark Gachacha. And, and he spent nine years researching Gachacha. Moved his family to Rwanda part of that nine years researching. He's an excellent resource for me. I mean, I would like Rwandan voices too, but often one hasn't had the privilege to write about it. And people will often write, oh, so are you, you're writing about the genocide? Are you Hutu Tutsi? The world will try to throw that lens onto them to sort it out. So I mean, there's a role for all of us to learn and research these cases. But the, but the, the people after, you know, the guy confesses, the community asks them questions and everything, then they'll move to that next stage, the repair part. And the judges will decide, can this person be safe to work in the community? Not repaying. And I, I, I don't know how to say this more powerful, except that just, I mean, more clearly, you can't pay back for killing. There's just no payback to all those things. So often we throw up our hands. Or we say, lock them up for life. That's the best we can do, is lock them up for life, you know. And Rwanda's like, no, no. We need them back in the community. Their spouses, their children need them back. I mean, she's a midwife. We need her back in the clinic. He's a teacher. We need him back in the classroom. They have been doing the worst of worst crimes for three months. But it's interesting. When I asked that first prison picture I showed you, I asked the assistant warden, kind of a weird question. Maybe this is not appropriate, but can you tell the difference with prisoners who are here for genocide or prisoners who are here for regular crimes? And he goes, oh, oh yeah, easily. The ones who are here for genocide actually help us re-socialize the other prisoners. In my mind, you know, genocide is this horrific crime, which it is, but they had not been conditioned in that crime for years and years. They had not suffered a lot of the, the pain, the loss, and the struggles that sometimes drives people into crime. I, it's a whole other story to unpack, but he says if we have, need a work crew to work outside the prison, we'll always fill it first with people who committed genocide to work in the community. And they are the ones the lowest recidivism rate is among those people. Coming back, they almost never come back to prison, the people who were part of genocide, which was just another kind of mind blower for me. Um, and so people will get a chance to come out and to reinvent themselves and for, in their own brain and in the minds of the community because our goal is to get them safely back in the community. And, and so um, a student says to me, so wait a minute, <laughs> in Rwanda people who committed genocide get community service? What a joke. And I said, I really hear you. What you say resonates with me, but, but let's look at these two systems with another lens. This first one is very transactional. You do this crime, you get this punishment. Huh? And, and the punishment of community service for genocide is, is, is obscene. It's obscene. But if I can put on a different lens, if I take off my transactional glasses when I'm looking at this, and I start to ask myself, can people change? How can I break the cycle of violence? Does transactional behavior break the cycle of violence? Some people with a Christian background will say the only thing that really makes me want to change is unconditional love, or grace is the word they'll use in the Christian vocabulary. That's the only thing that makes me want to change. Most of my, most of my thing is I, I want to beat the system. I want to not get caught next time type of a thinking. And so my question is, well, my daughters, uh, our daughters, when, when they were teenagers, and here they are, you saw them as little kids, here they are as adults. I always challenge people, I'm like, I bet you can't tell who I photoshopped in there. <laughs> Jay had to work that week, too. And so I'm like, this picture is so incomplete without Jay, our son-in-law. But that's Sean, our, our youngest, his fiance, Emma, who's a restorative specialist at a middle school. She's actually working on her PhD in restorative education. My wife, Teresa, our son-in-law, Jay, our daughter, Lisa, with, the, with our two grandsons and Mindy, Lisa, our oldest daughter. Mindy and Lisa, when they were teenagers, got training to be lifeguards and water instructors and, and swim instructors, and, and they wanted to work at the pool in town 30 miles away, we lived in the country in Oregon. And I'm like, girls, do the math. You know, 30 miles gas, four hours of day, minimum wage, you're gonna spend all your, I don't think I was quite that harsh, that sounded like harsh, girls do the math. 
But, I, but I'm like, practically, this doesn't make sense, guys. But fortunately, they kept at it. And I'm like, and I was, I don't know, somehow, someone tapped me on the shoulder or something and said, this is good. And halfway through the summer, one of them is wearing a baseball cap from Acapulco. And I'm like, where'd you get that? And uh, they're like, one of my swim students went on vacation and bought me a hat on vacation. And I'm like, transformative. This summer is not about a transaction, the gas money, and the miles. This is about growing up. It's about taking responsibility, people trusting their kids' lives in your hands as a swim instructor, cleaning barf out of the swimming pool. It's about, it's, about, it's about transforming. So when you look at that with a transformative lens, you're like, yes, that was a fantastic summer. Transactional lens, so what's more important, transaction or transformative? Of course, transformative. So now I'm asking myself the question, how many times do I miss transformative opportunities because I'm blinded by transactional thinking? Does that, does that, does that resonate with some of you? It's really making me think and reevaluate so many things. Will I take time to do that? Yeah, it might not be practical, but man, it builds relationship. Man, this is healthy. I've been in my downstairs brain too much here. You know, this is going to be an upstairs brain experience conversation. So, I, I said I would stop with 15 more minutes, and so um, I, I could stop here, but I want to. I want to just give you one more story. No, no, no. I'm going to stop there, and I can give you a story if you want. If you want to stick around, but this transactional, transformative, that's um, that's a big game changer for me too. Upstairs brain, downstairs brain, recognizing that in myself. I mean, it's easy when you get a tool to recognize it in others, <laughs> right? And, and that can be helpful at times if it'll promote empathy. You know, this person is really stuck right now in their downside brain. I, I, I discovered years ago in my marriage that my wife is deaf until she feels heard. Oh, flip it around, I am too. I'm deaf until I feel heard. When I feel heard, it's like the stoppers come out. And then I'm like, okay, so what do you think? You know, but we want to be heard. That that idea of of um, of of letting go of control and I actually honestly I just lost my train of thought. What my connection was between oh yeah empathy and anyway. But questions or comments because what I do have and I'll come to you is I have a story of Maria and Philbert. But actually, I'm probably going to let you read that story on the website if you want to dig into it. And I'll just show you a few graphics of Ann Filbert and an illustration of how this lady who survived and the man who killed her husband and sons as an 18-year-old will, will not want to see each other when he gets out of prison. They'll try to avoid, but he knows where her husband and sons are buried. And she'll say, that was the turning point between me and Filbert. And when I say the turning point, that's when she will begin to see Filbert as more than one thing, as more than a killer. See, this is a massive, for me, turning. I just use this phrase, one thing thinking, and I haven't found a better phrase yet for it, but that's defining people by what bothers us the most about them. And the more you fire that pathway, man, I was pretty much down on TSA from the get-go. As Soon as I saw him taking away a water bottle from grandma in that LA airport, I was like, this is wrong, something's messed up here. And then I just kept finding more and more things to criticize for TSA. Until the day that I, I was at TSA some years ago in Spokane, and I forgot my little wallet. Now I had my, my passport so I could get through, but I'm not gonna be able to rent a car or anything, I'm visiting schools. My wife can't get home in time to get back for the flight. I call my brother who lives nearby. He's really, we operate a little thing. He gets the wallet. He's driving. She's going to turn around. I say to the TSA guy, my wife is, I hope, going to show up in a few minutes. I'm not just loitering here. I'm waiting to get my wallet. He's like, well, you tell me when she's here, and I'll go out to the curb and get it for you. That one little act of a TSA man changed everything for me. In fact, I bet you want to see his picture, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I didn't take it that day. For years, for years, I would, I would um, find him and thank him for years. And then just um, two years ago, I was in another terminal where he had switched to, and I found him again. I'm like, hey, can I get your picture? He's like, of course. Officer Peterson. Yeah, Officer Peterson. I said, you know, your kindness that day just totally changed things for me and TSA. 
because kindness, kindness doesn't cost anything. No way. Yeah. So, so this idea that we can rewire our brain, Maria, she will start to find all kinds of reasons to find the good in Filbert, to build new pathways about Filbert. He confessed multiple times. When I heard it, I'm like, once is fine, now get out. But for her, every confession was building positive pathways in her brain about him. He was threatened when he decided to, con what, deciding, should I confess or not? Other prisoners threatened him. He went against those, Maria's like, thank you. He went after those guys who killed her husbands in the same gang, wouldn't stop until they confessed. Kept going, wouldn't stop until they came and apologized. I could give you a longer list of things he was doing. She was rewiring her brain. And the cool thing is that when we're consistent about, you know, they often say, you know, three week challenge, or now they're actually saying it's more, you know, if you do three months, you've really nailed it. But, but this idea that the brain is about efficiency, when you keep firing certain new pathways, it's like, okay, we gotta make it more permanent. But they say that the NGF is not in abundant supply which is a pretty cool thing because it's like, the brain is like, hey, she's pretty serious about these positive. Anybody not using your NGF? And, and, and it's potentially, I mean, I know this sounds a little bit like a Disney movie, but it's potentially that they're answering back. And they're like, um, she's not been firing the angry pathways much lately. Here, take our NGF. And that's what they call pruning. And so her brain is literally rewiring Filbert. Now, she'll never lose the pathway that he killed her husband and sons. But that pathway was surrounded by anger and bitterness and confusion for years. Now that pathway, as she's learning the truth, is still there. But it's like, wow, this is the same guy who killed my husband and sons? It's unbelievable. And she, when I, was, when I was there, this was 2019, she could tell that I was struggling with this guy. And she kept telling me more positive stuff. They, when the daughter grew up, they had both so rewired their brains that they invited him to the wedding. No, no, no. They didn't just invite him. I was like, okay, fine. Put him in the corner. Mm -mm. They asked him to be the MC. And, and I said to Maria, I said to serious Maria afterwards, just in private, did some of your family survive and come to the wedding? She's like, yeah. Weren't they angry that you brought this guy? And she's like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, so why'd you do it? She's like, it was our, it was our wedding. It was our home. Our choice. My family doesn't, she's telling me in effect, my family doesn't define my journey of breaking free from anger and bitterness. My, I'm the one in charge of that. And she says, you know what? When my daughter had kids and asked him to be the godfather, his family was angry at, at him. My response, I'll give a rip about him and his family. Because I was still stuck in 1994 myself in one thing thinking. But then I discovered, here's Maria's like superpower. She deserves to be in this. I put her in the spotlight. She deserves to be there for the rest of her life. But she courageously, empathetically, tenaciously steps out of the spotlight and puts Filbert in. And when she was able to start looking at life through Filbert's eyes, it was transformative for her. And she can tell him stuff. So you know what? Her final, and, and you've got to look at this picture. Her final um, comment to me is, It's wonderful to be part of making somebody beautiful again. And Filbert is beautiful. And I love this picture. I didn't take it. My friend took this. I can give him photo credit. But this man, he's looking at the woman who has given him again and again and again gifts he did not deserve. And in his case, he is sorry. It's another case when they're not sorry. Huh? This is not one size fits all. I'm not telling everybody you should. I'm not even telling myself you should be like, okay, I do tell myself I should be like Maria. But, but it's, that's my choice. That's my choice because I want to get free from my anger and bitterness. And, and, and um, Maria is, Maria, Morgan Freeman interviewed her for his Netflix series, The Story of Us. I'm like, you lucky dog, Morgan Freeman. You got to beat Maria, you know? You just, anyway, um, yeah, there's, as you can tell, plenty, plenty more stories, but if you need to leave, please, I totally understand. I've already, we've been here longer than an hour. Um, if you have questions, though, I'm happy to do my best. Yeah, I had said that earlier on Alan, and then, <laughs> and I'll, I'll reveal. Could you show us a picture of your <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so here's the, here's the framework of the picture of my grandson. I was not convinced that Philbert was sorry. He did not look sorry to me when I first met him. He didn't look remorseful, he oversimplified. I'm like, I want you, you know, I, and then later when I'm journaling, I'm asking myself, so what do you want, Carl? This is 25 years later. You want him to be walking around for the rest of his life with his head down and, and not looking anybody in the eye and, and, you know, is that what you want? And part of me is like, yeah. But the other part of me is like, okay, so what do you want? What do you want for your grandkids, huh? Is that kind of world you want for your grandkids to grow up in, where you don't get a second choice? Or, you know, well, certain people can get a second choice, but, but not this guy. He's done the unpardonable. Or do I want my grandkids to know that when I want to let go of anger and bitterness, I'm not choosing. Damas, the director of the orphanage, he went from saving people's lives in the orphanage, from telling his neighbors, this is not who we are, this is not Rwanda. What we're doing is not who we are. To after the genocide, he's chosen to be a Gachacha judge. And the leader of the killing squad who um, circled the orphanage during the genocide with the intent on killing everyone, this is the story in the 40 minute film if you, if you choose to watch it. I stumble on this guy in prison 21 years later. This guy wanted to kill Damas and then kill all the kids. That's what that was the typical MO. You kill the leader in front of everybody, then you kill everybody else that's there. This guy years later will be in front of Damas, will be the lead judge. Damas will recuse himself because the guy, I mean the guy, they used to play soccer. Okay, he played more with his younger brother, but they were neighborhood kid friends. And, and Damas, when you talk to him about forgiveness, we lost Damas last June, kidney failure. But when I would take teachers to talk with Damas, you got to look at Damas's face one more time. Or I actually have a lovely picture of him and his wife right here before he passed. Damas would say, he spoke fluent French. His English was a little, his English was like my French, not that great, but his English was better than my French. But Damas would say, in his, in his best words in his English, to these teachers and these young people, if you're going to forgive, don't pick and choose. Forgive everyone. Now understand, that is not reconciliation for everyone. That is letting go of your anger and bitterness towards everyone. And Damas inspires me to do that. Maria inspires me to do that. They inspire me to build a world that if I won't do it for myself, or I don't want to do it for the perpetrator, I'll do it for my grandkids. Huh? We'll do anything. Please. Uh, thank you for coming uh, uh, for coming to Rotary today, and I'm so glad I came back to hear you again tonight, Carl. But one thing you said today earlier about the internet and social media and how um, it's got a lot of benefits, but it seems like a lot of people in the world are operating at the lower part of their brain, the uh, the fear part, the the uh, insecure yeah. part, the the anger part because of the kinds of things they see on social media, and I wanted to get your thoughts on that, um, because it's affecting not just the United States politics, oh, yeah, but yeah, it's no, the globe. The, the, um, you know, it's easy, again, to look at this and say, oh, that's what, they were listening to the radio and they were in their downstairs brain, but you ask yourself, what sells the most on the internet, what gets the most clicks, and it's usually stuff that will send us, it's stuff that frustrates, it's stuff that inflames, it's stuff that, that, um, that uh, confuses. And, and, and so I am, I am thinking to myself, just in the same way as I was talking about TSA, I still have had some frustrating experiences with TSA after that moment. But you know what I say now? I'm like, okay, hey, I don't want their job. It's pretty a hard job to do. And I'm not gonna take this story. I'm gonna leave it right here at TSA. I'm not gonna tell it to the guy next to me on the bus. I mean, on the, on the airbus, on the plane. I'm not gonna reinforce that pathway in my brain. I came to a point, and it's not, I'm not making an excuse about PTSD, but I think it was one of the things that was really driving me to go get counseling and stuff with the PTSD. I was so critical towards my wife and my children. And, and I realized it's hard to stop being critical. So I said, I'm gonna be grateful. That's what I'm gonna do. And I'm gonna start with food, which is really easy. 
Thank you all the time to my wife. Thank you, Taco Bell. I said it to this morning when I got an oatmeal from McDonald's. I said to the guy, thanks for driving to work in the snow. Thanks for breakfast. You really, you know, you made my day. And as I spent time thanking people for food, I'm driving across the bridge in New York City, $15, and I'm not saying thank you. I'm like, you just, 15 bucks, that's a ripoff. But in the middle of the bridge, the thought comes to me, did you thank the toll taker? And I'm like, well, of course not. He's part of the system that run. No, he didn't. This morning at the hotel, the lady that did the breakfast bar, he pushed the door open to the kitchen. He said, hey, thanks for breakfast. And she's like, oh, you're welcome. Are you coming back tonight? I'm like, no, I'm, I was just here for a minute. Well, you have a good day. You have a good day. Dopamine with that wonderful exchange could have had the same thing at the toll booth. My point is, if I hadn't have been building thank you gratitude pathways about food, they would not have influenced my brain to say thank you to the toll. I have fun with toll takers now. I'm still a little stingy with my money on tolls, but, but I have fun with toll. You see what I'm saying? This, and so being aware how my brain works and how pathways can be strengthened of anger, frustration, and they will then not stay focused on TSA, for example. My anger, when I met the leader of the killing squad, this guy who, um, who wanted to kill Damas and was going to kill all the kids at the orphanage, man. I was so angry, I felt like vomiting the first time I met him. And I worked hard the next year to reframe this guy and to try to see him as a humor because I'm like, my one thing thinking is keeping me a prisoner of my anger and bitterness. And if I can see him as more than one thing, and this is before I met Maria, if I can see him as more than one thing, I might have a chance to get free from my anger and bitterness. I come back a year later, I find the first time it was an accident, second time on purpose, like Greg Well, last year I was so angry I didn't want to shake your hand. I didn't I didn't want to be anywhere near you. I don't want to be angry. He says, I could tell. I recognize you when I walked in the room. Now I was in the room with him for two hours before I heard his name and where he's from and thought, what? Is that the guy? And then I asked him questions and, and, and he answered and finally I I thought, guys, what kind of car did you drive? A green Mercedes. I'm like, there was only one in town. Like, and and so the second time he says to me, these three things. I recognized you. I was happy to see that you were still alive. I thought about you often. Yeah. I was like, man, right now. OK, I didn't recognize him, no big deal. But I was not happy to see him alive. I thought about him often, but every time, mass murder, mass murder. He killed Johnson's mother. And, this, and, and I had my stories of who this guy did and what, you know, who he was and what he did. And this guy is now talking to me like a human. This is 22 years after the genocide. I still got him clearly defined in 1994. And I said to myself often as I would come back and encounter people, I'm like, why are you so certain that they're the same? You're not the same. Why are you so certain they are? I will, I will instead of shaking hands at the end of this, I mean, he actually said, we tried to discourage you from coming to the orphanages, but you kept coming, kept coming, until finally we decided to kill you. I didn't know, is that like an apology? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what to do with that. Huh? I haven't been in a room with somebody like that before. I have no neural pathways to receive that. But we stood up, and instead of shaking hands, we ended up hugging. And we stepped back from the hug, and the hug was not too long, it was not too short, it was not creepy. It was like a healing hug. And I'm wiping the tears, and these guys, first time I saw some emotion, he's taking his prison uniform, he's wiping the tears in his eyes. And then my next thought is, whoa, 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 whoa so messed up. This guy and his gang killed more than 2,000 people. You just spit on the grave of more than 2,000, you just disrespected all those, what are you doing? Don't tell Johnson you hugged the guy who killed his mother. And for the next nine months, I am so cognitive dissonance. I, I am so messed up because the hug felt healing and I wanted to get free from my inner bitterness. But I'm like, you are, so find that journal. You know, you are disrespected. And in my journal, I said, okay, suppose he would have killed me and my kids would have found a way to get free from anger and bitterness. Would I feel like they were disrespecting me? No way. I'd be so proud. I'd be like, that's the legacy. You have broken the power that he has had on our family. Yes, he took me away, but he could destroy you and the next generation and the next. Get free. Now, I still probably wouldn't have been excited about them hugging the baby. Although today, as I've gone through the story again and again, I'm like, you do whatever journey leads you to, to heal. Get rid of that anger and bitterness. 
I don't see the guy for seven years. And, and I go with my teachers and students this time um, to see him last July, okay? He's got about three years left in his prison term. And um, I, uh, I just wanted you to see these teachers and students to kind of help you for a second. He's, they're sitting in a room about 30 of them, and I'm sitting face to face with Greg Wap and uh, the translator next to my friend Stephen. And I'm like, Greg Wap, thank you so much for agreeing to speak with us. Um, these are teachers, uh, uh, Holocaust genocide students who say, we are not here to judge you. We're here just to try to understand. And he says, well, thank you for coming. He says um, to the teachers, this man has come twice, and I've really appreciated it. In fact, the last time he came, I asked his forgiveness, and he forgave me. I couldn't remember anything like that. The students had asked me, huh, what did you die? And I'm like, I don't know, it's so emotional, maybe I missed it in the translation. And then later, I'm like, God, that's what he interpreted as I forgave him. I didn't realize it in the, in the prison at that day, last July, but he says, the government has let me go out at times to speak to crowds to confess what I've done. I mean, the guy is known. I talked to guys in the market a couple days later who were running stalls in the market. I'm telling stories that Greg Wall, you met him in prison? I mean, the guy's known all around the place for his notoriety during the genocide. And um, Greg Wall, um, I should have told the market because I lost where I was here. Greg Wall, Greg Wall, oh yeah, the government let me come out and confess in front of people and ask forgiveness. I've been looking for everybody I can to ask forgiveness. And, and actually, I want to ask you again today for forgiveness. Now for several years, I've been talking and exploring this forgiveness thing, and I, I rarely use the word actually anymore, because I, I think it's, it means so many different things to different people. I just want to talk about getting free from anger and bitterness. That to me is at the foundation of forgiveness getting free of anger and bitterness. And so when he says, I want to ask your forgiveness, I'm like, I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm like, Greg, well, I want to forgive you, but I don't know if I'm free from anger and bitterness. I become friends with people whose families you killed. Now, if I had planned it, I wouldn't have said that. But I wasn't planning it. It was just happening here. And and and, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm fumbling. This is an incredible opportunity to experience it. Now, I'm just fumbling. And Greg Locke slides out of his seat onto his knees in front of me. And he points at me and he says to the people, and I'm thinking this should be in private anyway. I mean, it seemed unseen right in open, but the genocide happened in open. He drops to his knees and he points at me and he says to the people, everything this man says about me is true. I did it. Man, that was valuable for me to hear. In my journey of trying to see him, it's more than one thing. And then he says, if I died, if you forgave me, forgive me, and I died tonight, it would be okay. Now, back sometime, I wouldn't want him to die feeling, I might not want him to die, but not feeling okay, or, you know, it's like, and forgiveness is not, because I'm still hanging on to this anger and bitterness. But by this point, I realize when he's on his knees in front of me, I don't want this guy to die tonight. And students have asked me, how do you know when you're free from anger and bitterness? And I'm like, you don't want harm for the person anymore. And in fact, if you're far along the journey, you might even want good for them. And so when he said, if I die tonight, it was like, because I've been fumbling, here's my answer. And I'm like, Craig, well, I don't want you to die tonight. I actually don't want any harm for you. I forgive you. He stands up, we hug. There's no, I forgot to tell you in my journal, talking about the kids and stuff, when I identified when I was journaling after the second visit, was you believe that you honor the people who were killed by staying angry at the person who killed them. A subconscious belief that I had held. When I bring it to the conscious level, I'm like, that's messed up. There's so many better ways to honor the people who were killed. I can, I can work to build peace, but it's very hard for an angry person to build peace. And so, so this time, when he stood up and, and, and we hugged and we're drying our tears, there's no sense of cognitive distance. I am not like this is messed up. I, I know how I want to honor the people who are being who are killed. And it's not in being angry at this man. Because my anger won't stay only focused on him. It can destroy my marriage. It can destroy my kids, my grandkids. That anger is like 
It's not laser kind of focused stuff. And so when he stands up this time and we hug and we're drying our tears. Okay, it's wonderful, but I still don't want to tell my Rwandan friends. Because man, if your family was killed, I don't know where they are in their journey. And I don't want to alienate myself from them. And I don't want to, you see that belief, that same thing with Filbert. When Maria was saying stuff positive, I was devaluing, discrediting, de kind of trying to devalue everything she said about him because I felt if you attribute something good to somebody who's done something horrible, you're diminishing their, their crime and their responsibility. Now that was a subconscious belief. When I bring it to the conscious, I'm like, no, 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 that's not true. That actually gets me in a place out of my downstairs brain where I can actually make an informed, healthy choice of what I want to do next. Whether I want to reconcile, because reconciling, I don't, I don't always recommend, I don't think reconciliation is always safe. I do think getting free of anger or bitterness is kind of a universal invitation. But this time when I stood up, there was no sense that I'm dishonoring the people who were killed. There's no sense that if I created some good, in fact, when I wrote months later to a teacher who was with me that day, and he asked me for some comments he wanted to share with the students he teaches in Poland, um, I said, great, well, help me. Now that might sound simple to you, but for me when I looked at those words, my old subconscious, just because you identify a false old subconscious belief doesn't mean that it goes away, okay? It can still have influence. I have to again and again fire the new beliefs, the new pathways, so they become the dominant influential pathways. So even when I think, I don't want to tell, and I have told some of my friends, and you know what they've told me? I'm like, I don't want to do that. They're like, Carl, that is your story. We want to hear your story. That is not you telling us. And I always try to tell people, I am not trying to be prescriptive. I don't want you to be like our, me or anyone else. I want you on your journey to choose what, what, what you, your path, but we have a chance to explore. People like Maria challenge me to explore my unconscious, subconscious beliefs. And these guys, even in the market, um, this, is, this is a staged picture. <laughs> but but I, I, I've taken the students that I was with to the market, and um, these guys, I, I told them, look, guys, I don't want to buy anything today, OK? Because they all want to sell me, sell me, sell me. I'm like, look, the only thing you can sell me is if you have a t-shirt that says, I'm not a customer. I will buy, it. I will buy that from you. <laughs> but I don't. And they're like, so what are you doing? And I told them, this, what? And you do what? And I travel to schools. And I'm like, what? You talk about these guys are all born after the genocide. They are so interested. Tell us, what do you, I've got my phone with the same pictures you see here, showing them, only it's actually their phone and they're using my phone to take a picture. I said, okay guys, I gotta stage a picture for my friends because this is too amazing. And, and at the end of this talking, and I even told them about Gregoire, just these strangers in the market, and they were so eager to hear the story. And they knew Gregoire, huh? And, and then at the end, I said, oh, but wait a minute, guys. I didn't take the time to ask any of you what your stories are. If you lost people, or you had people who were killed in your family, I don't even know, and I don't want to offend any of you. No, 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 no. They said, no. The same thing, my friends at the Kigali Genocide Memorial with university degrees studying the Holocaust and Genocide, the same thing they said. That was Rwandan I'm coming to believe. They said, no, that is your story. We're interested in your story. You don't have to be afraid of telling us your story. Oh, man. Afterwards, I'm like, guys, I'm sorry I have to go. My students, we've got to get them back for dinner. Wait, 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 we have a gift for you. I'm like, no, you guys, you work hard. I, I'm fine. No, no, no. And so they take me to their booth, and this guy gives me a couple baskets. <laughs> Thank you for staying. Thank you for telling our story. This guy gives me the little messy baskets. This guy gives me a flag. Ordinary people, but extraordinary people living in extraordinary circumstances <coughs> and an extraordinary time in history with lessons for all of us that are, that are just, I don't know, immortal and invaluable, priceless. <laughs> Honestly, you can stick by as long as you want, I'll talk with you, I mean, as long as you want. If some, I'm, I only have 10 books, if some of you wanted, um, we asked for, like I said, a $10. I didn't even ask people if it's okay, George. 
No, that's okay. Uh, if, if, if you if you wanted to. Well, we're, we need to print a bunch more. But if you wanted to make that donation in Venmo, or you could go on the website with your credit card, if you wanted. This is not Marie and Filbert. Marie and Filbert are in on our website. You'll find that story on the resource tab of our website. I hope Greg was story when I'm still ready to come and put it on the web. It'll be there too. But um, but thanks again for coming, George. Thank you. Thank for you. The, you know, yeah.